in the first third of the 1700s, the Roman Catholics came into the city of Salzburg and occupied that city that had been previously a Lutheran stronghold and uh, the Catholics gave the residents of Salzburg an ultimatum. Either you evacuate the city and leave it to us or you die. Not much of a choice, is it? Well, the Salzburgers packed up lock, stock and barrel and uh, migrated northward across the, the continent of Europe through Germany, came to the English Channel and applied for English citizenship. The King of England said, yes, you can become English citizens if you will sail to the New World and help Oglethorpe to found the colony of Georgia. Uh, of Georgia. The um, Salzburgers accepted the terms, boarded the ship, and sailed across to Charleston, South Carolina, just north of here, and then came to the little town of Ebenezer on the Ogeechee River, and there founded the little community of Ebenezer. It grew into a thriving town and uh, very thickly populated. They built a church, a Lutheran church in Ebenezer, which still stands to this very day. Believe it or not, for a short period of time in the late 1700s, Ebenezer became actually the capital of the state of Georgia. On February 18, 1796, it was made the county seat of Effingham County and stayed that way until 1799, three years later, and the courts were removed to the town of Springfield. The Jerusalem Lutheran Church, first organized in 1734, and then the main building was built in 1767 through 1769. Sunday school is still held every week at 945 and a worship service at 11 and the current pastor is Eleanor Russey, a woman pastor. hint of sulfur in the water. In the year that uh, Johann was born, this church was organized, came into existence 1734, while Johann was being birthed in Langenau time, Germany. The Salzburger community here was just getting started, and this church came into existence in 1734. Well, you say, well, how could he have been so involved in if he was just a baby? Well, remember, he came along about 30 years later, and this building that you see behind me was actually built in 1767. Johann was granted a land grant on the Ogeechee River in the early 60s. So he was already here, already a part of this church, and no doubt, played a part in the building program for this particular building that you're looking at right here. Who knows but what Johann Lastinger might have stood behind this very same pulpit, maybe to make the church announcements or perhaps the pastor asked him to receive the Sunday tithes and offerings. We really don't know that. One thing we do know for sure is though that Johann last year was a very active member of this church. So much so that even though he lived 11 miles away from the town of Ebenezer, every Sunday morning he would get up and get his family ready. And they would ride the mule and wagon 11 miles to come to church. I'm sure that must have been an all-day activity for them to go to church on Sunday at the Ebenezer Church. The pipe organ is still functional. 
same pipe organ that was here when Johann was here in, 17, in the 1760s. And uh, they still use it every Sunday. The church today is pastored by Eleanor Rusty. Eleanor Rusty. 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 Okay, Eleanor Rusty. You have to wonder what Johann would have thought about having a woman pastor 250 years ago. But times they are changing, and today is a new day a new world and a new culture. And today, uh, Sister Eleanor pastors this church. I have to confess to you, it's rather exciting standing here to realize that one of my ancestors played such an active part in this congregation. Or perhaps it was from behind this uh, lectern that Johann would have addressed the congregation and made the announcements or received the offering or whatever. Okay. Over 600 people still attend services in this church. The men would work on the church building weekend after weekend after weekend. No doubt, as we do today, they had work days. It's very likely that Johann actually laid some of these bricks himself. 237 years of time have taken its toll upon the old building, though. It's not what it used to be. And over the years, they have actually had to build uh, turnbolts in order to hold the building together. So it has these turn bolts all the way around the sides of the building, all four sides that bolt the building together. High atop the church's steeple is an ancient uh, weather vane. Look very carefully and you will see a little hole in the wing. That's a British musket ball hole that was there during, or, or put there during the Revolutionary War in the late 1700s. Fascinating, fascinating building. The church even survived Sherman's march to the sea, only because Sherman needed the church in which to house his horses. So he kept the church standing to be a stable for his horses, and fortunately it survived the Civil War. So it has survived the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and the only recorded earthquake in Georgia's history. The church has been through all three of those disasters, and yet it still stands today. It's really, really pretty and quiet and serene. There isn't much left of the Ebenezer community today. Mostly just this church and a cemetery. This would be the main house in which the people lived during that period of time. And this would be the front porch with the steps leading up to the main entrance to the house. In keeping with the building practices of that day, the kitchen was built totally separate from the rest of the house. A wooden walkway led back to the kitchen area. The well was placed near the kitchen for obvious reasons, because you needed water for cooking. The cooking all took place in this separate house out back, and in the event of fire then, only that house would burn, the main house would be left standing. One of the means of making money during that period of time, and even today as a matter of fact, was the raising of sugar cane.
This is a sugarcane grinding mill. A mule would be placed on each end of this pole, so it would be a, a two mule contraption. And then the stalks of sugarcane would be placed in the mill in the grinding area in here. And as the mules would march around and around and around all day long, the farmer would put the stalks of cane into the mill and the, the uh, cane juice would flow out through the bottom, would be collected in vats and then boiled down and sugar uh, uh, syrup would be made out of it and then from the syrup would be made sugar as it was further distilled. The sugar cane looks like this. And as it was ground and the juice was extracted from the cane, the juice was then brought into this area, placed in this vat. Fire was placed underneath it. It was boiled and boiled and boiled. At uh, one certain point, it would become heavy enough to be used as syrup. But as they continued to boil it and the moisture uh, was evaporated away, it would eventually turn into sugar. Oh. Anybody for some Geico insurance? The windows of this old house don't appear to be all that uh, different from what we would see today. But, as we come in a little bit closer, look carefully at the ripples on this glass. And you will see that it was not built to the standard of perfection that our machines do it today. The flaws in the glass betray the age of this building. I was doing some research one day in the college library in Americus, Georgia. And I heard the teacher of library science come by and explain to his class that in a certain section of that library were the colonial records for the state of Georgia. A little light went on in my brain. And I thought, I bet there's something in there about Johann Lastinger. Could hardly wait for that class to leave. In a few moments when they left, I got up and went. And sure enough, I found in the colonial land records that a hundred acres of land on the Ogeechee River had been deeded to Johann Lastinger in the mid-1760s. And over the years that followed, he continued to farm that land until finally he had a total of 700 acres that were his under his control. And he farmed that land. So he must have been a fairly wealthy farmer uh, in his later life. This is the Ogeechee River. A hundred yards or so in front of the church and through the trees is this old building here which is used to house all the archives and records of the church. The first time we visited this community we actually were allowed entrance into this and there's a library in there. We found a book that detailed the genealogical records of the John Lastinger family in America. This building was actually built before the main church sanctuary was and was used as an orphanage. A native son of Ebenezer, John Adam Troitlin, became the first constitutional governor of the state of Georgia in May of 1777. Wouldn't it be interesting to hear the stories that could be told by the hundreds of silent citizens of the sleeping city that lies before us?
The chances are that Johann Lastinger was personally acquainted with this man and his family, John Ulrich Needlinger and his wife, members of the original Salzburger community. John Berry would have been a teenager when Johann came to the town of Ebenezer. John Berry served in the Revolutionary War and died at the age of 60 in 1817. And he lies buried here in this grave. In all likelihood, Johann Lastinger knew this young man. A glimpse of the Confederate flags that you see flapping in the breeze here are a mute testimony to the number of people who served in the Civil War in this area. Just by sheer coincidence, if you believe in coincidences, the day we came to see the Ebenezer community, they were having their annual Effingham County days here in the town of Springfield. And so we decided to stop and take in the sights and see what all there was to see at Effingham days. And this is the county courthouse of Effingham County, the place to which all the public records from Ebenezer were moved when this became the county seat. From a very colorful period in Georgia's history, the infamous moonshine still. and a cannon that dates back to the Civil War era. This is the interior of uh, 
one of the homes of the colonial period, except for the electric radio, of course. Well, this apparently is the little girl's bedroom. And the baby crib. Did you see the baby bed, Rachel? Uh, <laughs>